to welcome everyone here this evening for our um, for this very special talk um, and welcome Donna as well. Um, I will say a little bit because it is a public talk. I will just say, because um, I know we've got some people that haven't been before, that we are an international organisation and our main goal is to realise the interconnectedness of everything, the oneness of all life. And we're really explorers of truth, or truth seekers is um, a good way to put it. Uh, I will just say, if you are interested in these things, that we have 12 branches around the country and we have a number of study groups and you can look up the programs on our website theosophy.nz. Donna is a traditionally trained Maori medicine practitioner. She is a passionate advocate for the sharing of traditional Maori knowledge as a means to address health inequities in the modern world. She is the contracted spokesperson for the New Zealand National Collective of Maori Medicine Practitioners. And she served two terms on the board of the South Pacific College of Natural Medicine and was and, deve and the developing of their NZQA approved graduate diploma of Maori Medicine for Health Professionals. She's a guest lecturer at the number of tertiary at a number of tertiary organizations around the country including the Otago University of Pharmacy. For three years, Donna was the resident Rongoa Māori presenter on the weekly Māori television series, Māra Kai. Donna's work today honours her obligation to her teachers to share and keep alive ancient healing principles in an appropriate, safe and respectful way for the benefit of all people, but especially for our future generations that inhabit this land and their evolving needs. You definitely sound like a theosophist, Donna, I have to say. <laughs> now, her presentation this evening is Maori Ways of Healing, a look at Indigenous knowing and healing by investing in understanding how Indigenous peoples interpreted their landscape and well-being, considering innovative ways to bridge the gap in health equity in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So very exciting. So please give um, Donna a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Many of us study when, actually I have to start by saying before this talk, I actually couldn't say theosophy very well. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of fitted in the whole anthrop philosophical kind of, you know, make, trying to make sure I get my syllables right, so if I slip up, please forgive me. Also, please forgive my voice. I've had about three days of constant singing, so my voice is a bit crackly, and I can't sing, so please don't ask me to sing. <laughs> it's just what you do at some family occasions. Um, so many of us study a multitude of religions, philosophies and cultures without an understanding of the philosophies that relate to this land. So my job tonight is to try and introduce some of those things to you for those who don't already know them. I'm happy to take questions at the end and um, you know, no question would be disrespectful. So it is all about sharing and about learning so please don't anybody feel like your question might be rude but you'd really really like to ask it because it won't be rude because you don't mean to be rude so please feel comfortable to do that the land that we have collectively chosen as our new home has its own way of speaking to us so we have a lot to learn from those who have inhabited this land for more than 800 years and their accumulated knowledge born of bearing witness over more than 20 consecutive generations to her repeating cycles and the intricate web of interconnectivity that exists uniquely on this land. The application of that knowledge has particular relevance to those of us who now call New Zealand or Aotearoa our home. We have an opportunity to ex access the timeless stories of this land through the eyes of its indigenous population, to see, touch, taste, smell and come to know the gifts of this special place and to share in that time-honoured knowledge. 
The opportunity to learn through doing is synonymous with knowing. Knowing inspires real passion for the things we believe to be important and innovates unified calls of action. Many people throughout the world are now acknowledging and appreciating the fine balance between the physical, mental and spiritual aspects of our existence and our undeniable interconnectedness to the land and the universe as is taught by indigenous cultures throughout the world. So perhaps in the, perhaps in the 1800s when New Zealand was first colonised, those who had already lost touch with their own indigeneity considered the belief systems of indigenous populations to be uncivilised and riddled with superstition. Superstition is described as the irrational belief that future events can be influenced or foretold by specific, unrelated behaviours and occurrences. You'll notice on the board my words in brackets. They're not part of, the quote, of this quote, but they're my understanding. It kind of makes better sense to me. Mataranga Māori, traditional Māori knowledge, is defined as the knowledge defined as the knowledge comprehension or understanding of everything visible and invisible existing in the universe, and is often synonymously used with the word wisdom. Lived traditional knowledge engenders understanding, tolerance and compassion in our search for universal truths. It stimulates empathy for people that we have never met but whose plight we identify with. We don't have to look far to test the world's growing empathy for people we have yet to meet when we recall the pain and sadness we felt for the badly burned victims, carers, rescuers and families connect connected with the eruption at Fakari last month. And to go an even bigger step further, when we think of our Australian neighbours as we witnessed real time through the power of rapidly evolving technology, the devastation, bravery and tragedy that beset those communities affected by the catastrophic fires earlier this month in Australia. Technology has increased our capacity to communicate across the planet and cross-culturally, especially when we embrace global social media networks to draw attention to, to organise and to promote a different trajectory. Technology is helping create a renewed sense of spirituality and identity beyond racial, religious, national and ethnic identities and our once limiting geographic borders. I've never been a great fan of the technology by the way, sometimes we just have to wake up. New technologies have provided an unprecedented opportunity to connect global indigenous populations and like-minded communities of interest to influence the conversation. As a result, it would seem that the balance of power is shifting and achieving critical mass to change the current trajectory of a globally polluted and exploited land and seascape is now possible. So tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi mahana ki, a, ki ngā tangata o ngā hauewha o te aonui. My name is Donna Kerridge. I am a first generation New Zealander on my father's side. I am a 28th generation New Zealander of Māori and Waikato Tainui descent on my mother's side. And just to show off, she's one of 29, so we think we own half the coast. <laughs> I stand in front of you today as the living embodiment and the face of my collective ancestries, who have sacrificed much so that my life might be full and rewarding, and so that I am able to continue the work they set in motion many, many years ago. I have the privilege to work in my community and across the globe as a traditional Māori healer, Indigenous Peoples Advocate and Contracted Spokesperson, as we heard before, for the National Collective of Rongoa Māori Practitioners, Te Kāhu e Rongoa. I would like to acknowledge the previous speakers at this year's convention and to thank them for their wise words, inspiration, special insights to those things that are dear to our hearts. I'm disappointed and I apologise that I could not be here earlier to share in their wisdom. 
I would also like to thank my teachers, those who have invested their time, their love and their support in my growth and my service to our community. I would especially like to acknowledge my dear friend and Pautoko Manoa, or, or mentor. Some of you here have already um, come and spoken to me and you already know him. His name is Rob McGowan. So ngā mihi ki a koe, mō tō tautoko ki a hau e te rangatira. It's me acknowledging him and his gift of time to me. At a time when the world appears to be gripped in chaos, war, terrorism, racism, poverty, global warming or pollution and social injustice, there does remain hope. The ability to transcend the physical limitations of our existence and embrace our spiritual connections to inspire the hope of a different reality is, is on the table for us. We only need to choose it. I would like to share with you today the ancestral philosophy that supports my practice of traditional Māori healing and to offer you a brief insight into my personal spiritual journey. I forgot to show off my whānau pictures. Oops. <coughs> there they go. Oh, there. So you'll see there um, in the bottom right-hand corner are my English whānau. Here are my Māori ancestors through the Waikato, my mountain at the bottom, things that are very important and dear to my spiritual context, the river, the, you know, the, the river that cares for us and my marae and our original marae, the very old and dilapidated looking house on the side that I grew up in. So no matter where I've travelled in the world, the principles of indigenous healing are the same. The words, the plants, the methods might offer different, might differ, but the philosophy doesn't seem to change. They undoubtedly share common threads. If you look at this wheel, the global healing practices, for me, the rim reflects what most of us see as the point of difference between our different practices. So for example, you know, I've often thought I'd really like to be a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner because I just love needles. <laughs> so acupuncture, I think I'd be really good at. My family are not convinced. But these are all the things that define our differences, our point of difference. But if we look at each of the wedges, for me, they reflect the history and evolution of the distinct philosophies. The things that we don't always put out the front, because it's our points of difference <coughs> that we tend to certificate. So, you know, if you are a traditional Chinese practitioner or an acupuncturist, you get to know all the meridians and things like that, and where to stick your needles, and all the other important things that you need to know, and then you spend 10 hours on the philosophy and history. 101 TCM. Mm -hmm. For me, it kind of needs to be flipped around. But anyway, and the centre reflects the shared principles of all of those different ways of healing. And, and in none of these practices are we, humankind, at the centre of the universe. That centre of that wheel represents to me Mother Earth, Gaia, or Papa Tūnuku, as I know her to be. It's never the people. So to understand healing from a Māori perspective, it's important that we can grasp three concepts. And I apologise in advance for those people who already know this. I think it's important, before I go into my talk, that at least you understand where I'm coming from. I don't represent all Māori, but I represent the teachers who have taught me. So for me, if you, I need to share with you my interpretation of tikanga, of Modi, and of wairua. Otherwise you're just going to think I'm crazy. Or we can all just be crazy together. <laughs> so for me, tikanga are our terms of engagement with the earth and with each other and our communities. Tikanga are the rules by which we engage. They are what keep us safe. They are the rules into which we must conduct ourselves that are culturally appropriate, our culturally appropriate health and safety plan. Modi, for me, is the gift of life. All things have a modi, a life essence. My nephew once told me how he describes to the young children that he teaches what modi is. He says, Auntie, I tell them all that we all have a candle that resides in the pit of our stomach. 
And sometimes that candle in people shines brightly and sometimes not so brightly. And that light is a reflection of our modi and our well-being, of our vitality. It's like a zipper that binds the physical to the spirit in order to maintain balance. So we don't go too far one way or the other. The zipper holds us together. But like zippers, sometimes the teeth get a bit worn and we start to lean one way. It's the whole idea for me of rongoa Māori, traditional Māori healing, is to lift the Māori in others. The other word that you see on the screen is wairua. For me, wairua is the world of connections. We are the living face of our ancestors, including all those that came before us, the plants, the birds, and everything else that was in existence before we were everything else that created our possibility. We are, all of us in this room, our ancestors incarnate. We are the living embodiment of our tūpuna. They're not gone, and our healing is empowered by their presence. Nothing exists or grows in isolation, including us. Nothing heals in isolation, and especially not us. For every action we take, there is a reaction. Every single thing that we do, say, or think matters. Just because people can't see our thoughts doesn't mean they don't exist and doesn't mean they don't have an impact. We are the straw through which wairua, we are, we are the straw which wairua, the greatness and ancestral healing energy, passes. We are not the healers. We are simply the vessels through which healing passes, if we allow ourselves to be. I'd like to share with you a poem. Some of you may have already heard it. I see it doing the rounds. It's been around for quite a while. It was written by Heather Delamere Thompson. I'm assuming by her name that she comes from Ngai Tuhui, which is along the east coast of New Zealand, Bay of Plenty. And the poem goes like this. Grandfather, what is Wairua? The child asked, eyes wide. Wairua, my little one, is what gives us life. It's handed down to us from a time past. At the moment of your beginning, you shared with me the wairua of our ancestors. For I am your link with the past, and you are my place in the future. The love of our family has wairua, and their words, their laughter, their tears, our marae, tangi, waiata, and whakapapa have a wairua that strengthens us and gives us pride. So too the sunrise and the sunset, the soft summer rain, the raging storm, the song of the birds in the trees, the waves on the beach, the mist rising from the bush, the moonlight on the water, and the embracing darkness of night. To sit quietly in our meeting house or our cemeteries and feel the presence of your ancestors is to feel wairua. Your arms about my neck your breath on my cheek fills me with a special wairua, for there is wairua in all things that give meaning to life, to love, to the future. So my child, open your mind, let your heart love, your eyes see, your ears hear, your hands feel. Give of yourself, my little one, for in giving you receive, and the wairua grows. So if my explanation wasn't clear, I'm pretty sure that poem was, in terms of what is wairua. There are a number of other healing concepts that um, are important to our practice, but so as not to um, swamp you with a whole lot of Māori kōrero, I've just chosen a few that stand out the most. The first is manakitanga, often translated as hospitality. But for me, manakitanga 
means to elevate the mana of our visitors and others, to lift them above ourselves, to build up their mana, to give them the very best that we have to share and acknowledge their value. Hospitality doesn't quite do it for me. So much more. Another um, healing concept or practice that we use is whanaungatanga. Whanaungatanga is kind of translated to genealogy. And while that's correct, I think it's more about acknowledging our connections. Our connections to all of those that have gone before, not just our human connections. The third one is kotahitanga. For me, kotahitanga is that we work as one. We all have our place. We all have our gifts. We all have our contribution to make. Our achievements are the product of the whole. Nothing is anything without everything. Kaitiakitanga, for me it is the act of caring and protecting the well-being of others, of special knowledge and of Mother Earth, Papa Tūmaku. Whakapapa reminds us that we are the living embodiment of those that have gone before. Without them, we are nothing. So Māori healing is the oldest medical practice in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But I'd like to remind you that no Māori ever migrated to New Zealand. We were Pacific Island peoples looking for a better life. When we arrived here, we had to name every tree. We had to find a word for every bird. We had to find a new name or a name for every river, for every bend in every river, for every mountain, for everything that was new to us. All of that became te reo Māori, the Māori language. We became Māori. We weren't Māori when we arrived. And what made us Māori was the land. It is the land that created our language. And without our land, our language makes no sense. Our culture makes no sense. The land, you'll often hear Māori say, I am the land and the land is me. That is where it comes from. Being Māori makes no sense without Aotearoa New Zealand. If you take away the land and you take away everything that it means to be Māori. And I hear people like Rob McGowan say for some Māori, and I've had my day in the sun, being detached from your culture, from your indigeneity, and remember every single one of us are indigenous to somewhere. Being detached from your indigeneity is like standing in a room full of strangers with no clothes on. Can you see how that might affect us when we're not connected? When we're not connected to the whenua? So Rongwa is not about disease, or Māori healing is not about disease. Its focus is on well-being, not on cure. It is about restoring Modi to the people and equally the land. It is about re-establishing our connections with nature. Nature is our blueprint for health. All things are connected. Many of us are born and be bred city folk. And for us sometimes that can mean we don't like the rain on our face, least of all in our hair. We don't like the mud in our toes. And we refer to God's creatures as creepy crawlies. How detached have we become from our family? To me, disease is born of 
derangement of natural law, nature's order. Healing is about restoring the core values and natural laws, L-O-R-E-S, eroded by social and economic demands in a modern society. We live in a society that values independence over interdependence. And as a consequence, we are losing our connections and therefore our well-being. Well-being is a way of living in community, human and nature-filled. It is not a one-size-fits-all, quick-fix, one-time event. It is a way of living and understanding the world. Rungoa Māori or traditional Māori healing has a number of practices that we associate with it. This is but a small sample because remember everything is connected so therefore everything heals. However, for me, and I keep repeating for me, one of the things you might want to learn early if you're studying tikanga Māori or Māori culture is never go away from here going, no, that's not right, Donna said. <laughs> because you're going to get a big twack around the ear from some big Māori woman who goes, who's that Donna? <laughs> so I'm sharing with you my understanding. I've been told by my teachers, go and learn from as many people and peoples as you can. We do not need to create a whole lot of clones of, you, of me, your teacher. We already have one. We need you to go out there and learn from as many people as you can. Discern what sits well with you and create your way of healing in a way that is true to who you are. And only when you learn from the multitudes and from many cultures will you be in a position to understand what is right for you and your family. But the, the crux of that conversation was, for your own safety, do not leave this room going, because Donna said. <laughs> so, to get back to the points I was trying to make, karakia for me is more than prayer. It is often translated as prayer, um, because that's probably the closest English word that we can use. But for me, Karakia is more than prayer. Karakia is a way of binding us as a group. It is a way of creating a modi that belongs uniquely to that group. It is a way of protecting us as we work together. It is a way of clearing the way for us to do special things and for us to make special connections. It is a tool that we use to help connect us more readily to our ancestors so that we can prepare and execute the learning or the healing that we've come together to do. So, you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to try and um, impose my will on anybody in terms of what prayer means. This is my understanding of how we use karakia. Mirimiri and rumirumi are traditional Māori forms of body work. They are not the only forms of body work, but they are two that you will most commonly hear. For me, Māori body work is much more than clever massage techniques, soft tissue manipulation or joint mobilisation. For me, our body work is about connecting to soul. Our body work is about ensuring that we reconnect with every cell of our existence, so it's not always pleasant, and so that we can truly appreciate the context in which we exist. We have a number of other forms of body work that we, we do as well, but those are the two that you'll hear most of. We have different forms of body work to help prepare for a baby to be born. We have forms of body work that help people to prepare to die so that their body can be in a correct state for the mourning procedures that we have. After people have passed, we have special body work that we use to help them on their journey. So our body work 
is much, much more than soft tissue manipulation and joint mobilisation. Much, much more. Matikatea are the people amongst us who have the gift of second sight. These people are much more than clairvoyance. For them, or for us, it is their ability to transcend the veil and access our ancestral library of knowledge for the benefit of all. Many of our matikite were incarcerated in the 1950s, 1960s as crazy people. Many of our people in prisons, particularly our young ones, Māori being at the top of the list, are matikite. They are matikite who have not had the luxury of elders to recognise that gift in them, to put their arm around them and to say, come with me, let me help you. Let me help you make the best possible use of this gift. But matikite is another way that we heal. Toi Māori, Māori arts, is another way that we heal. I'm sure that there won't be anybody in this room who wouldn't appreciate the gift of a beautiful voice in terms of healing. And we have a, a, a tohunga, somebody who is an expert, and, and I'm not an expert. I've got, I started too late and I have many more years of learning to learn. But our experts who started from before they were born, who once said sometimes, the best massage you can give, the best healing through midi midi you can give, is through the kind words that you speak to each other. So there are many, many forms of healing. We have um, our taonga or our special musical instruments. One of them is the pukaya. It's a big trumpet-like instrument. This pukaya has, is bound with harakeke, with flax, a flax twine. And as that is as that pukaya is being created for a family and that binding is wrapped around the pukaya, the whakapapa, the ancestry of that family is chanted into the creation of that pukaya. We use that pukaya among other things to help with the birthing of children. So as a child is coming into the world and coming down the birth canal, the pukaya is played into the child's fontanelle. So that child will forever know its whakapapa and where it belongs. So our healing instruments, our musical instruments, are also our healing instruments. Rungwarako, often translated as plant medicines, for me, is much more than lotions and potions, even though I'm one of the primary teachers of that here in Aotearoa for Māori. But it's much more than lotions and potions. It is about helping people reconnect to nature. It's about restoring the modi of our natural world. It's not about brown bottle medicine that I was taught when I trained. We used, when I initially trained in another modality, we learn all about the amazing qualities of ginkgo. We used about the, We learned about the amazing qualities of um, golden seal. If you took me outside, I couldn't tell you what it was. Brown bottle medicine for me. Mine is about being able to touch, feel, see how the plants grow, see the special gift that they contribute to their natural community, and then I will know how to use them. So you can see that there's a, a multitude of modalities. I don't like that word, but I can't think of another one, so we'll use it. But more importantly for me, it is essential that we understand the importance of our connections and what I refer to as the threads of disease. For me, when people come to see me in my clinic or my home or wherever I might be, because Rungwa Māori is nothing like clinical work, you can go somewhere and somebody will come running up to you and say, excuse me, Faya, my, my grandfather is very sick. 
can you please come and you might be on your way to a family birthday party and as an obligation you go. So for me the things that I see most often repeating at the bottom of our appalling well-being statistics are first and foremost loneliness. When we are lonely we choose different foods, we exercise differently and sometimes through indiscretions that we don't know how to heal we withdraw even more and that has a huge, that disconnection has a huge impact on our well-being both spiritually and physically. Hopelessness. When people lack hope this is where we see people with addictions and sadly it is where we see youth suicide. Homelessness and I don't mean the government's um, definition of four walls, a roof, roof and warm dry homes. I mean knowing where you belong. Where is your home? Where is your place to stand? When no matter what terrible things you may have done, you belong and nobody but nobody can move you on. For Māori, that is our tūranga waiwai and it is important to us that we all know where our tūranga waiwai is, even if we've never visited it. We can turn up one day and no one, but no one can move us on. Knowing where and how you belong is extremely important to your well-being. The fourth most common thing I see is people who lack a purpose beyond meeting their and their family's own immediate needs. What is it that you contribute to your community? How is it that you know you belong? What is your special gift that you bring to the world? And they don't have to be gifts of grandeur. I was, um, had, a na had a dame Nada Glavish is a guest speaker at a um, workshop I was hosting and I said to the group that you do not have to be a dame to heal. Dame Nada reminded me that sometimes it can be quite helpful. It can open doors. <laughs> However, our deeds and our acts of kindness and our gifts do not need to be grand. They can be as small as calling in on a neighbour to see if they need anything from the shop. They can be as small as bringing the newspaper in each day for your elderly neighbour. Because what that tells your elderly neighbour living alone, she will never ever rot in her bed unnoticed. Big fear for many of our lonely elderly. Just knowing that someone will check every morning that you're still breathing can make a huge difference to somebody's quality of life. So know your gift, know how you contribute to your community. For me, ill health is a social issue long before it is a medical issue. When we inspire hope where there is previously none, we heal. When we know where and how we truly belong, we heal. When we know the special gifts that we bring to our community, it gives our life purpose and it carries us through the times of difficulty and uncertainty. We heal by nourishing the body, mind and spirit, not controlling them or destroying them. We empower by sharing our healing knowledge rather than withholding it in order to assert our individual self-importance. We offer new perspectives and inspirations by opening the doors to the spirit world rather than denying or dismissing other realms and possibilities considered less relevant. Again, we are the straw through which these gifts pass. We are not the healers. Nature and the world of connections are the healers. 
we are little more than the vessels of healing. Our tools may change over the generations, but not our values and our, and our founding principles. As Māori healers, we rely heavily on our senses, our soul senses, a concept posed by Joy Bell, our pūmanoa, our, in, our intuition, our tūhono, our connectedness, our aroha, our love and empathy, our tiakitanga, our guardianship and our protection, and utu, our notion of reciprocity as well as the more widely recognised senses of sight, hearing, touch, taste and smell. For me, rongoa Māori, or the Māori art of healing, is loosely translated to to sense. Rongo being of the senses. Nature is our blueprint for healing. Know the special gifts of the land. When we know how to heal the bark on a tree, we learn how to protect our skin. Trees live in communities. They need each other in order to remain strong when subjected to the elements. When we know how to restore our wetlands, when we know how to heal by freeing the flow of water, ensuring our filters have an environment and the appropriate nutrients they need in which they can thrive, we also know the secret of how best to care for our kidneys. They are one and the same. Our ancestors knew the language of the land. They knew the best time to harvest plants, such as kawakawa, and they knew when not to harvest plants, such as kumaraho. I was really fortunate earlier last year to participate, and, and don't all hiss at me, in a genetic um, genetic modification um, internship at Waikato University. And the only reason I went on that, because you know, genetic modification is a bit of a dirty word to some of us. And the only reason I went on it, because as an um, advocate for things Māori at a policy level with the Ministry of Health and MB and other organisations, I'm the one sitting in the corner with my arms crossed going, no way, no how, not on my shift. And then I realised I actually didn't really know a whole lot about GMO stuff. So when I was offered the internship to move me to the dark side, I gratefully accepted it with the view of very clearly stating my intentions. I plan to turn this around and throw it back at you when it doesn't suit my philosophy. I learnt a lot of stuff. I learnt that I don't have the right to tell a family who might suffer from a condition, and the one that comes to mind is Huntington's disease, to say that by reversing the DNA on a single gene can prevent that being passed down through families. Who am I to say that that family cannot access that? Don't get me wrong, I'm not in favour of it. But at the same token, I learnt a little bit of humility but more importantly for me, some of the tikanga, some of the practices that our ancestors had can be explained through genetics. So I was always taught that kawakawa, one of our healing plants, is always to be harvested as the sun is heating up, not as the sun is going down. And that the, if you can get it just in time before it reaches that peak, it is the best time to harvest it. Well, all these scientists told me that's because it activates certain genes. The heat activates certain genes in those plants. <coughs> I'm like, yes, my tupuna had it. They knew that. <laughs> and other times, other plants, like when it rains, suppresses certain genes. Genes that obviously are necessary to our healing knowledge by using the plants. So, you know, I got a lot from that. So I'm, I'm really glad I had the humility. Well, actually, that's a lie. I actually thought I could just throw it back at them. But I was humbled at what they could do. And so 
I think that it's important that that we look at all perspectives. We don't shut ourselves off to things just because no way, no how, not on my watch doesn't feel right to me to be playing around with our native plants like that. And I do still think that way, but I am a little more humble in my approach. For me, our ancestors knew the healing capacity of Tāne Mahuta, the guardian of the forest, of Tangaroa, the guardian of the sea, and Ngā Maunga Tūpuna, our mountains. When we feel overwhelmed, and I tell this to our rangatahi, our young people, all the time, when you feel overwhelmed, do not pass, go straight to these places. Do not pass, go, do not collect $200. Let the Modi of the bush, let the Modi of the sea, let the Modi of your ancestral mountain envelop and heal you. Go sit, go be in their presence. Do not ask for anything, do not take anything, just be, and they will heal you. I have yet to meet a person who walked out of the ngahiri, out of the bush, in a bad mood. I am yet to meet a person exit the ocean after swimming in a bad mood. I am yet to meet a person who grew up near a mountain to walk away from that mountain grumpy. These special places have a modi, they have a healing modi, and they can see inside to what we need, and they can share their resources to offer that healing to us. As science advances, indigenous healing practices are looking less and less flaky. Epigenetics, traditional Māori knowledge relating to intergenerational trauma, for example, are one and the same study. Natural gene suppression, as I talked about before, and activation are part of Māori tikanga in terms of when the right harvesting times are. How is it that Māori knew that Saturn had rings around her? Her Māori name is Pariaro, the ring of leaves. How is it that people could travel backwards and forwards across vast oceans to find Aotearoa and their way back home at different times of the years, yeah, without a GPS, without a map of the Pacific, a compass, or heaven forbid a sextant? How is it that we can know things that we have never been taught. How is it any of us in this room can know things we have never been taught? How is it that a mother knows that her child is crying when she is far away? My ancestors, Māori and Celtic, were also able to apply their intimate knowledge of the land and the special gifts of specific flora to discern which plants to use to relieve discomfort associated with certain physical health conditions. For example, the trees that heal the land after it has been scorched by fire, like kumaraho, were also the very plants that would heal human conditions inflicted by fire, burns, respiratory issues associated with smoke inhalation. Plants such as mamaku, the black tree fern, that soothe Papa Tuanuku after she has been ripped apart through a landslide, are the same plants that we use to heal complications associated with childbirth. Māori, like all indigenous cultures, share a spiritual connection with the land that has sustained them for many generations. Call it intuition, call it unconscious bias, wairua, we all have it. We just need to relearn how to connect to the living world around us, rather than trying to master it. Rungoa Māori to me is the study of the world of connections. Endless ripples born of cause and effect, based on centuries of observation and complex reoccurring patterns, or as we refer to it, maramataka. I consider Western medicine to be the intricate study of isolated components 
and their intimate workings within predetermined limits or controls. Tested using RCTs, Randomised Controlled Studies Trials. Māori perspectives on health and well-being are important because they provide culturally appropriate well-being solutions for the people of this land. They add to a modern knowledge repository of healing and bring centuries of old science back to the light for all to access. They give us focus on the important things. Our health is little more than a reflection of the health and well-being of the land that sustains us and our attitudes toward other members of our wider family. There have been many times in my lifetime when things have happened that science would struggle to explain. In the beginning, I consigned these things to the ooky spooky corner, but with gratitude for the fact that something actually worked, even if I had no idea how. The reality of the healing power of wairua, our spiritual ancestor, ancestral connections, was too big a leap for me to confidently make in my early days. I tried not to think or speak about these things in case people thought I was crazy or getting a bit too full of my own ability. But as time passed and such instances continued to randomly occur, I started to pay more attention to them. When did they happen? I would search for what might have been the common denominator in these events. And then, how could I harness them? All about me. While I have some theories, the answers to these questions and the workings of wairua and spirit, for the most part, still elude me. But one thing is for sure, they were real. I know that, and I know that miracles do happen. And I know that miracles are just things that science has yet to explain. I could share many examples with you that simply remind us of the magic, the divine, inherent within us. And that the more we operate from a place of integrity and connectedness, the less random those healing events become. And the more we acknowledge the spiritual aspect, the easier it is to connect to and facilitate healing more readily. There are many things that I know that I don't recall ever having learnt in my lifetime, but there is no question in my heart that I know them. I believe, I believe that I know these things through the spiritual connection to my ancestors, to the land and to all who have gone before me. Just for a moment, and my intention is not to offend anybody, just for a moment, consider the notion that Mother Earth and God, whoever we might define as our supreme being, we're one and the same. Would we treat her any differently? In the words of one of my greatest inspirations, traditional knowledge is only of value when it is used. That is when it is implied in a modern context to the real realities of today, rather than just talking about it. We must use it to bring it back to life, to the land, and therefore to the people. Traditional healing practices are a way of belonging to the world. They are not a treatment. They are, not about, they are about putting our roots deep down in the earth in order to sustain ourselves. Those are the words of Rob McGowan. It is through doing that that we derive our knowing of infinite potential. Our potential to disrupt what has become the status quo for recent generations and affect change is limitless. We are all sparks of the divine. We are the living embodiment of the divine. We have within us, within our reach, gifts and tools necessary to overcome our challenges. New technologies have provided an unprecedented opportunity to connect global indigenous populations and like-minded communities of interest to change the conversation. As a result, it would seem that the balance of power is shifting and achieving critical mass to change the current trajectory of a globally polluted and exploited land and seascape 
that is now possible for us to overcome that. As the world's inhabitants unite and begin to act in the interests of the planet and the right to survival of all its inhabitants, the masses are initiating a powerful and unstoppable landslide that will overwhelm and assume the assumed and immoral rights of businesses and individuals to exploit and pollute the planet's resources with no regard for the plethora of other species and people who depend on them for their survival and the insatiable appetite of corporations to compete, to expand and to accumulate wealth and power for the few who foster their growth. I encourage you to trade in any self-limiting definitions and allow yourself to become part of that unstoppable landslide enabled by modern technology. That is the people's global network and, the, and our appetite for change that is about to force the recalibration of our moral compass or hasten our demise as a species. For we are now entering a real time of consequence. I implore you to use your gifts to reconnect with our wider family in our natural world and use our communal wisdom to shine a light on our infinite spiritual capacity. My ancestor, the first Māori king, Pōtātou Te Whiro Whiro, spoke these words at his coronation in 1858. Translated, they say, there is but one eye of the one eye of the needle through which the white, red and black threads must pass. After I am gone, hold fast to the law, L-O-R-E, the truth, the love, forsake all else. He was speaking of all races who would come to Aotearoa and how we must live and work together as one for our survival. Our well-being is predicated by the well-being of all others in our global tribe. Our interconnectedness and ability or inability to act with one heart, one breath and one world will determine our destiny. Do you think that the masses are reflecting indigenous teaching and we are coming together to this critical mass? Do you think that's happening? I absolutely do. I was the first one to go, oh, Facebook's a pain in the neck. Facebook just makes people feel bad about themselves and it's all about comparing. But I think of the people that have inspired me, that I've met through social networks. People that just turn up at my house, uh -uh. say hello, and I think, I would never have met you. I would never have sought you out if it were not for technology and social networks. So yes, I think we We've not recognised that. We've been too busy going, ah, oh, Facebook sucks. But actually it is empowering. There are a lot more people thinking like us. In fact, it's a public conversation. 20 years ago that wasn't the case. We need to not shun these things. We need to embrace them. They are the way forward. And we can go back to sending smoke signals if we want. <laughs> But we should embrace new technology, in my view, in a way that works for us. Kia ora. Would you please tell me about the matakite? Matakite? So, um, I'm not matakite, but I'm going to share with you a story that, um, two stories actually, about matakite. Because for me, just getting a whole lot of bunch of words is a bit academic. But I like to tell stories that illustrate to me in the hope that it illustrates to you. It may not, and you're allowed to ask another question. But the, the two scenarios that I think of with regard to matakiti is when I was teaching at a tertiary organisation, I was talking about the gifts of matakiti and how they're used to heal. We broke for lunch and a, a European looking lady in her mid-40s came up to me as the class left the room and she had tears in her eyes. She wasn't crying but she had tears running down her face. And she said to me, I think I'm one of them. I went, really? 
And she says, I've never told another living soul. Not my parents, not my husband, not my children, not my siblings. I thought I was crazy and I was afraid of what might lie in store with me if I started what, to share what I could hear and what I could see. She said, can you help me? I said, I'm not matakete. We all have the potential, but you know, I'm human and I can put my head in the paper bag just as easy as the next person. <laughs> but I said to her, I do have friends who are matakete. Would you like me to ring them? And would you like to go and talk to them? She said, I would love that. I rang my friend and she said to me, don't I just bring her to our workshop next week? It's on her I bring her there. And you know, I can never chat to her, no problem. I said, oh, great. So I looked at this woman and I said, are you game to come on a marae? She said, I've never been on one. And I said, would you like to come? And she said, I absolutely would. I said, okay then. So we go to the marae, it's a big workshop. I'd forgotten what the workshop was about. It was actually about caring for the dying and the dead. And I thought, uh oh, this is really in the deep end. And I couldn't sit with her because I was presenting at that workshop. My friend couldn't sit with her because she was organising the workshop. So she kind of got left to her devices for a couple of days. And we talked about all, of, all the things that we do to, to help people pass over and all the things that we do to ensure that their journey is a good one. And at the end of it, I noticed that my friend hadn't been talking to my new friend. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> and we left. And outside the gate, I said to her, look, I'm so sorry. We were so busy. She said, Donna, please don't apologise. Please, please don't apologise. For the first time in my life, I was with a bunch of people that talk like I've always wanted to. I'll be fine. Every couple of years I get a text at Christmas time just to say Merry Christmas from this lovely lady. So I'm not sure if that answers part of your question, but another example of matikete is I was teaching a class in the bush, a bunch of diverse people. Ten minutes in, a lady comes up to me, she goes, excuse me, Donna, could I have a word in private with you? I thought, oh my goodness, I've been here ten minutes and someone wants to complain. <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, when we go back for lunch, there is a room off the dining room, we can have a conversation in there. No sooner had we got back to our base and she came up to me and she said to me, can we have that word now, please? And she was quite matter of fact, there was no saying no and there was no putting her off. So we went into the room and there were two chairs there. I thought, oh, okay, serious. She goes, sit down. And I think, I'm the teacher. But I'll sit down. I sat down and she walked around behind me and she put her hands on my shoulders. I thought, wow, I'm going to get a healing. This is awesome. <laughs> and she started to talk to me and she started to say in a very loving, caring, firm voice, there is somebody that came to me out there, they're still on this side and they want you to know that there are, they cannot help you as they have in the past and that their time is coming to an end and that they want you to know they can do more for you on the other side than they can on this side and you are not to be sad. I wasn't upset. I did drive home, the three or four hours drive home. I figured out it was a he because at some point she said he. Uh, son, husband, brother, who's it going to be? But I wasn't frightened. And I never told another living soul because I felt peaceful. Two weeks later, my father, who was otherwise well, 78 years old, passed out and died in a shopping centre. I wasn't sad. I wasn't sad at all. And my little sister, who we bullied into doing the eulogy at the funeral, <laughs> cried and cried and cried her eyes out. And for us, we have an open casket and we have them at home or at a marae. And my father being English, we didn't dare take him on a marae because he'd haunt us for the rest of our lives. So we had him in the lounge. And when it came time to put the lid on the casket, which is the, the teariest, saddest moment for us, is my little sister is working herself up 
And so are my other sisters, and I'm thinking, right, time to share the conversation. I'm the only one not howling my eyes out. I'm sad, but I'm not howling my eyes out. And so I say, oh, just before we put the lid on, Dad, I need to share a story with you all. And so I told them the story. And my little sister got, got up and came to the front of the room with me, and she said to me, I can do the eulogy now, thank you. And she did a great job. So this is how Matakatea heal. This is one example of how they can heal. I rang that lady as soon as my father died. Well, I didn't actually. I emailed her and she rang me. And she didn't go, I told you so. She didn't talk in circles. She said, just remember what I told you. And that was all our only conversation. So does that, yeah? Kia ora. Story's always better. They're true though. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, in theosophy, we have this concept, and the way I see it is that everything is con it's interconnected. Absolutely. There's nothing that's not connected to this. Mm -hmm. So when there's disharmony, like we see perhaps global warming or net engineering or mm -hmm. all sorts of manipulation of what I would call this field of reality, perhaps, mm. then there's a possibility for us to reconnect that field, as far as our own actions and thoughts. Children. Often we look for someone else to do the work, to make the change. But my feeling is that we, we are all part of this interconnectedness. We all have the power to do yeah. this work. Does that sort of resonate with... Absolutely. It's a lovely way of describing it. It's like reconnecting the, the neurons in our brains after a stroke. You know, just because they've been severed doesn't mean, oh, we're all doomed. Mm. We can reconnect those. We can make them work again if we're lucky. And like I said before, yeah, this is the time of consequence. This is where we pay the piper. This is where we step up. Our choice. Absolutely our choice. Not the government's choice. Not his choice. Not her choice. Our choice. And we all make it as individuals. Nō reira, nā mihi nui nui, kia koutou i tēnei pō. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora.